Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI 124 Queen Street, Durban. On the 23rd of August 1983, Mr. Ahmed Didat gave a talk in the Durban City Hall. This talk was entitled, Christ in Islam. Now, people from many different religions and faiths were in the audience uh, of the City Hall that evening. Some agreed, some disagreed. Although there was a question time after the talk, uh, a lot of questions still remain to be asked in the eyes of many people. And today in the studio, we have two born-again Christians who would like to talk to Mr. Devet on that subject. I'd like to introduce you to, first of all, Mrs. Irene Malon, who is a housewife and a very staunch Christian. Good morning. I'd also like to introduce you to Mr. Jonathan Leach, who's a minister in the Christian Church. Hello, I greet you in the name of Jesus, who is risen from the dead. I'd like to introduce you, of course, to Mr. Ahmed Didat, who is the head of the Durban office of the Islamic Propagation Center. I deem it a privilege if I can remove any misgivings of my brethren this morning on okay. the subject of Christ in Islam. First of all, uh, Ahmed, if I may ask you, um, do you feel that the statements that you made on the 23rd of August this year are, are correct and do you still stand by them? I still stand by each and every statement I have made. Thank you. Uh, first of all, before we move on, do you have a, a general comment you'd like to make, uh, Irene? Yes, I do. I would like to say that um, the Jesus that is referred to in the Quran, we, d we do not believe to be the Jesus that we believe in in the Bible. Thank you. And Jonathan? Well, I see on the notice the subject is Christ I in Islam, and I believe that Christ is not in Islam. Thank you. Can we move on to the first question or the first point that we're going to discuss, please, Jonathan? Well, it was a two-hour meeting, and so all we can do is major on one or two significant facts. And the first issue we would like to raise with you, Ahmed, is that you said categorically there was no statement in the Quran with which a Christian could take exception. And we want to take uh, total exception to the references to Jesus in the Quran. We don't believe that the Christian Jesus and the Islamic Jesus have anything in common. He's spoken of as Ibn Maryam, son of Mary, as Masih, the Messiah, Christ, as Rasulullah, the Messenger of God, Abdullah, servant of God, as the Spirit of God, as the Word of God, as the sign of God. These are all the respectable terms applied to this mighty messenger. <laughs> there is not a single statement in this vast volume which one of the most jaundiced of Christians could take exception to. And in the index you'll find the subject Jesus and the J on page 1837. Jesus, a righteous prophet. Chapter 6 verse 85. His birth is described in two places. His apostle to Israel, his disciples, taken up like Adam, not crucified, no more than apostle, not God, sent with gospel, not son of God, and on and on and on. Well, there we are. Over to you, Jonathan. Well, it's uh, our delight to share our faith in Jesus as 
as God manifests in the flesh. And for the Quran to state that Jesus is not God and not crucified and not the Son of God totally uh, contradicts your earlier statement that Christians could not take exception to anything written in the Quran because the Christian faith centers on the person of Jesus as the Son of God, as God the Son, revealed in the flesh, part of the Godhead uh, himself. And in his humanity, it centers on his death, his atoning death, the shedding of his blood as a sacrificial lamb, uh, in terms of his humanity, and his resurrection from the dead. And therefore, uh, in those writings in the Quran, as Irene has so rightly uh, pointed out, there is the clear distinction that the Jesus uh, of Islam is totally different from the Christian Jesus. Brother Jonathan, we are fortunate in this age that we have this gadget, the videotape, video machine. What we saw there was me expressing the noble manner in which Jesus Christ is spoken of in the Holy Quran. If I can remember myself saying that Jesus is spoken of in the Quran as the son of Mary, as the word of God, as the spirit of God, as the messenger of God, and on and on. And in that context, regarding the person and personality of Jesus, I was talking about, I said there is not a single statement that the most jaundiced of Christians can take exception to. I was not talking about dogmas or teachings of the church. I was talking about Jesus. If you remember what you saw and what you heard, it was about his person. Ahmed, what I heard you say, and maybe we need to rerun it if I heard you wrong, is that there was not statement in not one statement in the Quran to which a Christian could take exception, and that only a, I think a mentally afflicted Christian right. could take exception. Now, uh, the statements that we have seen in the Quran uh, say that Jesus is not God, and we say that Jesus is God. They say that he was not crucified, and we say that he was crucified, and has risen from the dead to justify us from all our sins. And we say that uh, he is the Son of God, and you showed that in the Quran, the Quran says that he's not the Son of God. And therefore, in terms of your statement, that there's not one statement in the Quran to which a Christian could take exception, we have shown you that as Christians, we totally reject the Jesus of the Quran. No, I don't blame you for doing that, uh, Jonathan. Because you were watching that video tape with emotions. You were not listening to what I was saying and in what context I said that. Because this index that you, we had reproduced, from which you are taking exception to, in the part of my talk, I mentioned that there are 15 different chapters in which Jesus Christ is mentioned and is spoken of. And we are not dealing with those 15 different chapters, with the different aspects of the differences between Islam and Christianity with regards to what you say, his divinity, with regards to what you say, uh, crucifixion, and all that we have, your trinity. Now, Islam and Christianity are at variance on these points. They are. But what I was, they are. But what I was talking about was that this man Jesus, what uh, personally, what he is spoken of in the Quran, as about regarding his birth, regarding his miracles, regarding the status which he holds in the house of Islam, in that context is that there is not a single statement regarding Jesus, his person and his personality, not a single statement to which the most jaundiced of Christians can take exception to. And I still stand by that. If we are going to talk about dogmas, you see, what you believe, what I believe, they are different things altogether. And if you want to discuss, you know, different aspects, I was thinking that we're going to discuss what I had spoken about. Precisely. Because I didn't speak on the subject of crucifixion in that talk of mine. I didn't speak about uh, the divinity except in passing to say that, look, what can make him God or the Son of God, literally. So. The thing that I have mentioned, spoken of, during the two hours that you have been talking about, that I spoke for almost two hours, what did I say that you can take exception to and I can try to satisfy you yes. on that? You're actually asking for specifics there. Specifics. Yes. Mr. Didot, I would like to say here that are we uh, not right in saying that uh, what we have just seen from your program 
uh, as coming from the Quran, which is that Jesus was not crucified, Jesus is not God, statements that we have spoken about now, those very statements you have said that we cannot contradict. Now, this is precisely what we're talking about, is that you have made statements in the Quran, and you have said that we cannot deny anything that the, uh, the Quran states concerning Jesus Christ. Now, those statements in themselves deny the very person, and you cannot separate the relation of the dogma with the man Jesus. You cannot separate what Jesus has done for humanity. You cannot put him alone and, and say that the things that he came to do are divorced from his personality. <laughs> I think uh, we are at variance here. From what we have seen, what I'm talking about in the context of my talk, yeah. it is the attributes of Jesus I was speaking about, his person, his birth, the nobility, the manner in which he treated his mother, was respectful to his mother, unlike I was comparing, contrasting with the Christian scriptures, where he seems insulting to his mother, calling her woman, what have I to do with you? Whereas the Holy Quran says, he says, I have, he, God has made me kind to my mother, and not overbearing or miserable, like calling people you hypocrites, your generation of wipers, your whited sepulchres, nothing like that is to be found in the Holy Quran. So, this is what I was referring to, that in the person and personality of Jesus, there is not the most jaundiced of Christians he can take exception to. I, I think not in the context of the whole Quran. That he says, look, you say Jesus is God, we say he's not God. Of course you can take exception to that. You believe in a triune God, we say no, God is absolute one. He is not one in three or three in one. Right. You can take exception to that. You say he was crucified, we say he was not crucified. Now all these are, to me, different subjects, and I deal with them differently. When I go to the city hall, I speak about was Christ crucified. Then I deal only with crucifixion. Right. Right. Uh, the truth about the atonement. Yeah. I speak only about the atonement, right. whether it's true or false. The truth about Trinity. Yeah. I speak only about the Trinity, whether it's true or false. Yeah. So that means that each and every subject that I touch, I mean, an item I touch from that index that you show me, yeah. it is a subject by itself. Yeah. Here was Christ in Islam, that this is what we think of Jesus Christ right. in the house of Islam. Yeah. Now, if I said anything about Christ there, you know, which seems insulting to Christ, mm. this is what I said, you can't take exception to anything. Alfred, I, I think you and I anyhow are coming to a, a point of agreement because you are identifying the divergence of conviction about Jesus of Nazareth. And as long as we are very clear about those divergences, then uh, we will certainly be in agreement. Uh, what I want to come back to, and I'm quite sure all the viewers uh, and listeners to the video will, will recognize that you made a categorical absolute statement. You said there is not one word in this holy book to which even a jaundiced Christian can take exception. And we have been pointing out those specific words to which we do take exception. And now you're admitting that we can take exception to them. So in a sense, you have qualified your statement, and we are very happy with that qualification. <laughs> the trouble has arisen because when you watch that film, you were emotionally watching it. Had you had listened to it carefully in the context, you would have found that there would have been no reason to, you know, go into this explanation. Uh, Mr. Dillard, I would like to say something here. I think uh, it is not right for you to say that we were emotionally watching it because you have made yourself a judge of how we watched it. You are not accurate in saying that we emotionally watched it and that is why we came to the conclusions we came to. Do you well, understand? Well, this it? is for the viewer to judge. That's right. They have seen, they have seen the video. That's right. And they've heard my statement That's and right. they've heard yours. That's right. Let, leave it to them. To Let's them. leave it to Let's them. Let's That's it. That's fine. What we're discussing there is almost personalities, in fact, which I, I think, if anything, we should try and steer away from mm -hmm. uh, in the discussion Quite. today. Um, you, if I understand you correctly, believe that the, the Christ of uh, the Quran is a totally different Christ from the Christ in the Bible. Can you embroider a little bit on that? Yes. Now, uh, we'll move on, I think, um, into further points. We should be looking at the birth to which you made reference and to the miracles to which you made reference. Uh, but I'm, I'm warming to you, Ahmed, because uh, I believe you and I are, are seeing things much more eye to eye than I thought we did, that there is very little uh, truth 
uh, common truth in terms of the person of Jesus. That as you were pointing out on your video, that the Jesus, the Islamic Quranic Jesus, is a totally different being from the, the Jesus of the Christian faith. Yes, and what I said was, I think, that Jesus is a nobler and a sublimer personality in the Quran than in the Christian scriptures. Well, that is a statement to which we must object, because if Jesus is God as we know him to be, there is no one nobler or more sublime. In the Quranic scriptures, Jesus is but a mere prophet, however godly. But in the Christian scriptures, he's the revelation of God himself, and no one is more, no no more noble and sublime. But we wish to declare, in terms of your reference, I mean, uh, you may not have uh, spoken specifically about the crucifixion, but uh, on the videotape, reference was made to that page. And on the video that I watched of that meeting, that page, page is it 98 or 97, uh, where these words were, were put on the screen, they were put forward. Again, in its context, if you listen carefully, this is on page 1837. And the J, you'll find Jesus. Right. And in that sense now, the whole, all the, uh, the, the contents was given to you. Yes. Not that we are dealing with each and every, every right. item. Right. That there is an index, yes. and in that, this is how, right. and so many places is spoken of. Right. right. But we were still dealing with Christ in Islam. Yes, right. Not any other subject at that meeting. All right. Well, let us understand that the Christ in Islam the Christ in Islam is not God. The Christ in Islam is not crucified and risen. True. The Christ in Islam is not the Son of God. True. And therefore, the Christ in Islam is not the Christ of Christian scripture and Christian faith. Or Christian belief, I would say, rather. Of because yes, there are things Christian now Christian that faith. I can ex also explain from the scriptures. That the things that you are talking about, that his divinity. His deity. His deity. He says, now look, you have misread the statement that he had made. So in other words, Jesus Christ, in his lifetime, he didn't make any such claim to deity, to say that I am God or worship me. Yeah. And in that talk of mine, I was challenging the people. I said, look, there is not a single unequivocal statement where this claim is to be found. Unequivocal means to say that I am God or worship me. And I was challenging my audience that if you can produce any such verse, in the 66 books of the Protestants, or 73 of the Roman Catholics, I am prepared to accept it. Yeah. That offer is still open to you. Right. Right. Now, I'd like to answer that, that challenge because uh, throughout Christian history and throughout the Christian Church, there are many different emphases and many different perspectives uh, in terms of peripheral understanding. But the central revelation, and I say revelation, the central revelation in the Christian Church, down throughout the ages, of all different streams and uh, emphasis, there is no doubt whatever about the deity of Jesus. Now, I believe we can overcome this problem if we recognize that the Christian scriptures indicate that the revelation of Jesus as Lord, the revelation of the deity of Jesus in the Holy Scriptures is not mere rational deduction. No one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. And if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they should believe. And uh, let me just give you one scripture, but the whole of the scriptures to the Christian spirit is a clear declaration of the deity of Jesus. And I mean, Romans chapter 8 verse 7 says that the carnal mind is not subject to the word of God, is hostile and unable to receive it. So the fact that to the Christian throughout the ages the revelation of the deity of Jesus is, is obvious is counterbalanced that the scriptures warn that the unbeliever will not see it. And your inability to see it uh, emphasizes that truth. Now let me just try one scripture on you and you will find a way of rationalizing around it because the revelation of the Spirit is not there. In John chapter 5, for example, we read in verse 23, in order that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Now to the Christian, that is not a debatable issue. That is a revelation of the equality of the Son with the Father. 
as in Philippians chapter 2, equality with God was not to be grasped, but he divested himself and became a man. Now you're a theologian and you know these truths, but the, uh, the carnal mind, which is unable to receive the revelation of the deity of Jesus Christ, has to find a rational explanation. But uh, I want to submit respectfully for this, that no Christian would dream of interpreting Quranic scripture, Islamic scripture, uh, as over against the teachings of Islam. And therefore, in the same light, we are not going to submit to an, is an Islamic interpretation of Christian scripture. It is for Christian teachers, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, to interpret Christian scripture. Uh, Jonathan, you see, you have escaped the simple English word that I used. I said, unequivocal. I said, there is not a single unequivocal statement, I'm repeating, where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. Now, you have been reading the words of John. I said, Jesus, where Jesus says, makes this claim. So you presuppose that the person must have some kind of this different feeling, you know, being born again and having the spirit in you. Only then he's entitled to see and read. I feel that you are pre-condemning the man's approach to the book because your learned men, they tell us that if the plain reading of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Right. And that is exactly what I want you to do and I would like to do myself. Right. Simple statements where man says, I'm God, that means he must be God. He says, worship me, he deserves to be worshipped. Not your interpretation or my interpretation. What does the book say, the scripture? Because you are giving the impression as if Christian was unanimous in what you are talking now. Absolutely yes. unanimous about the day of Jesus Christ. But you know the Nicene Creed in the year 325 under Constantine. It was by a show of hands. Democratically, it was the only God who was democratically, democratically you know, appointed was Jesus Christ. That means there was a show of hands, and according to the show of hands, they voted in favor of what Constantine, Constantine wanted, wanted them to believe. But they have been religious persecutions on the grounds of the deity of Christ for the past 2,000 years. Millions have been massacred for that. You have today, even, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They are Christians. They don't agree with you. They're not no. No, they say they are Christians. The Christadelphians. They say they are Christians, they don't agree with you. The Unitarians, they say they are Christians, they don't agree with you. And the common man, when I meet the common man, the ordinary man, the man in the street, when I ask him pointedly, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate? He said, no, no, he's the son of God. I hardly find a person who is prepared to own up and say that the almighty God came down to earth in the form of a man, he was incarnated, he took flesh, and in the form of Jesus Christ. But, I don't know, I don't know that the born-again Christians, they make such claims. But I said, look, let us go back to the scripture. The Jehovah's Witness say, go back to the scripture. The Seventh-day Adventist says, go back to the scripture. And I'm sure uh, that the, the right, right attitude should be that you and I, we should go back to the scripture. Show me a verse a statement made by Jesus where he says, I'm God, and that we should worship him. May I at this point show you no, such Yes, you may. Um, I'm going to speak now just scripture. The fact that Jesus existed, he existed, before he became a man. Jesus is the name that was given to him when he was incarnate. All right, as a man, he was named Jesus. He existed before he became a man, written in Micah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Again, Jesus speaks of himself as existing before Abraham and before the world was created, which is to be found in John chapter 8, verse 58. Also in 17, John 17, verse 5. Also in John 5, verse 24. He is spoken of as the creator and upholder of all things, which is in Colossians 5, verse 15 to 17, in Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3. We also see in the book of Genesis 
that God speaks about creating. When he speaks about creating, he says, let us create. Then we go into New Testament teaching and we find that New Testament refers to Jesus as the creator and upholder of all things. So, Scripture has now spoken. Madam Irene, thank you. Sorry, before we go on, I we have quite a few topics to discuss today in this very short one-hour discussion. Um, do you feel, uh, Jonathan and Irene, that Ahmed has answered some of your questions? Or, or do you feel you've still not got the answers on this particular topic? Oh, I'm very satisfied that we have uh, established the divide between us. Right. Well, at that point, no, that, that that is can I ask you, would you like to give a, just a brief reply? Yes, I will give you a brief And then if we can move on to the next yes. topic, please. What I feel is that my brother and my sister, they don't seem to be understanding my English. Because I'm repeating again and again a single statement made by Jesus. I am God or worship me. Sisters quoting Colossians, quoting Hebrews. I said, who are these? Who is Hebrew and who is Colossians? This is, this is Paul. This is Paul. I'm speaking about Jesus. What did he say to, to make me to believe that he is God and that I should worship him? No, he's not coming forward. Either they don't understand my English. I said, unequivocal. They don't understand English. I said a single statement made by Jesus. They don't seem to understand my English. <laughs> I don't know how we can proceed can on I, that basis. Can when I, you must say that, look, we haven't got any such statement. Tell us frankly, you haven't got it. But now we have this. What have you to say about that? We have this. What have you to say about that? And I'll be happy to deal with it. Like you said in the book of Genesis, God speaking, he says, let us create man. This us in the Trinitarian Christian's mind stands for Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now I said, look, you don't know Hebrew. Arabic and Hebrew, as well as every Eastern language, has two types of plurals. They have a plural of numbers and they have a plural of respect. Elohim, that is the Hebrew word, you know, im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. Because no Jew for 4,000 years you know, did they ever believe that the God Almighty was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Father, Moses, and somebody else? They had no such concept. When they said Elohim, they understood the one and only God. In the Holy Quran, same Semitic language, Hebrew and Arabic sister languages, it speaks, that it is for us to send down the revelation, and it is for us to protect it. Ask any Muslim. Who is this us? Whether it is Muhammad, God Almighty, Muhammad and the Holy Ghost, the Gabriel, or anything else. He said, no, 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 it's God Almighty himself. But who is this us? He says, look, in our language, we have two types of plurals. This is a plural of respect, like in royal proclamations. So I can explain, verse by verse, if you put it to me, he said, what have you to say of this? But I still stand that there is not a single unequivocal statement where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. On the contrary, he says, my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said, of that day, no, but no man, no, not the angels, nor the son, but the father in heaven. Nowhere does he equate himself with God. Nowhere. And I still stand by that. Do you know sure. why? Yes. Do you know why? Because... When he came here, he came for a purpose, which was to take upon himself the body of man in order to go through what man goes through, in order to lay his life down for the sins of mankind to redeem him from such. Now, he emptied himself of his divinity, of his deity, to take upon himself the body of man. Scriptures revealed to us, which I have read to you, that he was before he became man, the scriptures reveal to us in John as well that he was with God, he was God, and that he came here to take upon himself flesh, all right? Now what the point I'm making is that Jesus did not claim to be God when he came here to be man, but he was deity and is deity. What, what was he afraid right, of? Sorry, sorry, at this Why point, we, we must right. move on, I think. Yes. Right. Um, can, can we move on to the next subject now, and we can continue on that basis? Yeah. Jonathan, can I hand over to you to introduce the next subject? Yes, I, I think it flows on, because we're going to look at your statements about the birth of Jesus, yes. which again hinge again on the issue of the deity. 
um, I believe that Irene has given you a specific scripture in showing that Jesus showed by saying that before Abraham was I am therefore and in using the I am he used the Yahweh Yahweh name the name of God himself uh, which is a play on words in a measure uh, but there is a clear and categorical, unequivocal statement to his pre-existence. Uh, right. Now, well, maybe, can, can, we we have, can we have a look at that sequence like then that. before we go on, Ahmed? Can mm -hmm. we just have a look at that sequence and we can discuss it based on what we've seen? Yes, I wonder whether we could look at the sequence to do with the birth of Jesus, right. because that is going to be very helpful. Right. Well, in, well, let's, in let's have a look at that now. Shall we do that? In the Holy Quran, the same thing is being spoken. But, the language. Wa qada amran. Whenever he decrees a matter, fa inna ma yakulu lahu kun fa yakun. He merely says to it, be and it is. For God to create, He merely wills it, and the thing comes into being. It is not necessary for the Holy Ghost or anybody to come upon Mary or overshadow her. The language. And the eminent Billy Graham, some years ago in Kings Park, I was there with my secretary, Mr. Vanker then. We were there, and he dramatized this birth of Jesus. He said, and the Holy Ghost came and impregnated Mary. This is how he did it. <laughs> the great Billy Graham impregnated Mary. The Holy Quran says, for God to create, he merely wills it, and the thing comes into being. Jonathan, your questions, please. Ahmed, this is... Uh a very good point you are making about the birth of Jesus. Uh, as you so clearly demonstrated, the uh, Islamic faith, exactly the Islamic religion, uh, sees Jesus as a creature, a created being, whereas the Christian revelation, which is open only to those who receive that revelation through the Holy Spirit, is that Jesus is begotten. And you made that very clear, and I, I think that's uh, very wise of you to make it very clear that the difference between Islam and the Christian faith, the Christian revelation, is Islam sees Jesus as a creature created by the, the divine fiat of God, as I think you made it so clear, and I think that's a good way of understanding how Adam was made. Uh, whereas the Christian revelation, which is open only to those who through the Holy Spirit have a, uh, understand that the scripture says, the Lord, he is God and no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit. And you said in 40 years you have never heard anyone explain the difference between being begotten of God and created. And I want to end your 40 years in the wilderness now Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. and to explain to you that begotten means exactly and precisely what it says. Begotten, fathered, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was indeed as man born of the Spirit, born of the Father, begotten, not made. And I'm so glad you made that distinction because it is central to the Christian faith and it actually establishes his deity that what is begotten of God is God and what is created of God is not God. And that is why the deity of Jesus Christ is revealed in his birth. Uh, that just as you so eloquently quoted Billy Graham saying that the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary and, 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 and uh, you seem to think that someone was upset by the idea that, that the Father sired Jesus. Well, I am not upset by that at all. It's absolutely scriptural. And therefore, uh, I want to ask you to confirm, as I think you have so eloquently said on, on, the, uh, on the videotape, uh, that the distinction between the Islamic religion and the Christian faith, the Christian revelation, is that the Jesus of the Quran is a creature created by Almighty God, whereas the Jesus of the Christian revelation is begotten of God, is an, a manifestation of God in the flesh. And we say, therefore, that Jesus, just as Billy Graham uh, pointed out, uh, it was born as a result of the impregnation by the Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And as Irene Mylon pointed out in our earlier on, we have therefore Jesus fully man and fully God. Now to an unbeliever like yourself, we do not expect that to make sense unless the Holy Spirit gives the revelation. 
because no one will say Jesus is Lord but by the Spirit. You see this expression we got John 3.16 I take it you have it in your American standard That's version. right. But the RSV you said you don't use it. The reason best known to yourself. But Christian scholars 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations I don't know whether you since you do not claim to belong to any denomination they went and produced this book and the, the testimonies the praises that which are being heaped upon this translation by Anglican church newspaper Church of England newspaper says that this is the finest version which has been produced in the present century. Times Literary Supplement says a completely fresh translation by scholars of the highest eminence. Life and Work says the well-loved characteristics of the authorized version combined with a new accuracy of translation. And the Times says the most accurate and close rendering of the original. They are claiming that this translation goes to the most ancient manuscripts. And in John 3.16 they have eliminated the word begotten because they say these are defects in your present scriptures more especially based on Jerome's Latin Vulgate the King James Version the author, authors here 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations they say that the King James Version used by a billion Christians today in different different languages King James Version it says yet the King James Version has grave defects by the middle of the 19th century, the development of biblical studies and the discovery of many manuscripts more ancient than those upon which the King James Version was based made it manifest that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. So they revised it. That is what the RSV is. 1952. And the word begotten they threw out as a fabrication, interpolation. It was a fabrication. So if this was inspired by God, if God said, I have begotten a son, it would be something. But since it was an interpolation, it's work of people, you know, with vested interest, like you would, you wouldn't use this Bible at all, because it, it won't suit you. Whatever you are out to preach, it hasn't got it. The Ascension is taken out, the verse on the Trinity is taken out, and there still remain those many defects, serious, grave defects, you see, which need certification. So this word begotten is a defect and they took it out. But Mr. Uh, Mr. Dida, yes, if we were going to base our belief on one word, we would be a lost people. There are many other scriptures which I can quote and which I've quoted. No, no, you quote one at a time. It. If you quote one at a time, like this now. That's right. The word begotten we are discussing, I said, look, this word begotten, you have to tell me now that these 32 scholars of the Christian Bible were not scholars. That they were lay people or barbers, shoemakers, that they went and produced this book. These 50 denominations that you don't belong to that, but those 50 denominations are all heathen or they are unbelievers. They went and produced this book and they made, they sold millions of this. And they made a net profit of 11 to 15 million on this book alone. May I quote yes. from this book, yes. the doctrine of the begotten Son of God from the scriptures, all right? The uh, word begotten. The word begotten, yes. Right. The RSV, I do think it's an inferior translation, but it's one you put your faith in. I quote. I didn't. This is your church that have produced it. <laughs> <laughs> your point is. All right. For to what angel did God ever say, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Or again, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. And in verse 7, of the angels he says, who makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire, but of the son he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, you t where was this quotation taken from? Hebrews chapter 1. Right. Quoting the Psalms. Right. So, we go to the book of Psalms. 
And we find that this was attributed to David. God Almighty is speaking to David. He said, I will declare a decree unto thee that thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. God is speaking to David. This day means today I have brought you into being. Begotten. When did God Almighty tell Jesus that I have begotten you today? In the canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Is there a single statement, voice heard from heaven, God saying that I have begotten you today? No. But this is what we read in the book of Psalms and God had spoken those words to David. Now if you take them out from there and you apply them as Paul has done to make God out of Jesus, well that is his business. But what I am saying is this, that Jesus Christ, that is not, it's an amazing thing, that you are not quoting me a single word of Jesus. Whatever you are out to prove, there is not one word I am hearing that Jesus said this or Jesus said that. You are quoting me Paul again and again. You quote, he's quoting scripture from the Old Testament. And I said, when you look at it on the very face of it, he's not talking about Jesus, he's talking about David. Actually, at that point, perhaps we can move on to the next topic and see if we can progress from there. All right. The next one, please, Jonathan. <coughs> the next... Uh, point that you made... Uh, which is of lesser significance, but we need to, to look at it again because it does flow on from the birth of Jesus. And it refers to your description of the first miracle. The first miracle that Jesus did and the, and the turning of the water into wine according to John's Gospel. And you make the point in your talk and again, I'm glad that you make the distinction, because I'm interested in the distinctions, that uh, the Jesus of the Quran speaks to his mother, and that the Jesus of the Quran does not turn the water into wine. And in fact, you make a reference in your talk that because Jesus turned the water into wine in the Christian revelation, uh, the, what wine has been flowing like water through the Christian church ever since. And as not a the Christ Christian dumb. Christian dumb. Uh, and uh, you make a, an inference that Jesus is therefore responsible for alcoholism. <laughs> Again, I beg your pardon. I never made such insinuation. I said, can we look at that sequence right. before we continue discussing right. it now, please? Thank you. Like to. And he has made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. He has made me kind to my mother and not overbearing or miserable. This is the first miracle that Jesus Christ performed according to this holy book of Islam. He defended his mother against an unbelieving audience as an infant from his mother's arms. I want you to compare this first miracle of Jesus with the first miracle that Jesus Christ performed according to the Holy Bible. You know what miracle he performed? It was at the marriage feast at Cana. You read in the Gospel of St. John that Jesus and his disciples had gone there and they ran short of wine. Wine. So his mother comes to him. He says, my son, knowing that he's got that mysterious powers, God had given him powers, spiritual powers, that he can perform miracles. So she comes to him. He says, my child, these people have run short of wine. Help them. Do something for them. So Jesus responds, he said, woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. But persuaded, he turns water into wine. And since then, wine has flowed like water in Christendom. Last year, our beautiful country, our good people spend 2,000 million run on alcohol. Last year, our good people spend 2,000 million run on gambling. The first miracle, Jonathan. Well, here again, I think we can see we're talking about two totally different Christs. And... Uh, one thing that you did refer to, Ahmed, in your talk was the, the difference between the first miracle of the Islamic Jesus being um, 
uh, being utterances as, a, as an infant and the first miracle of uh, the Lord Jesus as according to the Gospel of St. John being the turning of the water into wine and the inference I thought was inescapable that having referred to Jesus as having turned the water into wine you then started to talk about uh, alcoholism and the excess expenditure uh, of uh, people on wine and the only inference I could draw from that was that that was Jesus' fault. No, I was not insinuating any such thing. But since Christianity doesn't forbid the drinking of alcohol, uh, a leeway has been made. Christians are asking, posing the question when we tell them that they shouldn't drink, the problem that drink creates. They said, look, our Lord turned water into wine. He was not a killjoy. So what it was good enough for our Lord is good enough for us. This is the logic. Now, we Muslims, what we say is that under the circumstances, if these things did happen, we are not blaming Jesus for it. But the time was not ripe for him to introduce prohibition, which he left to somebody else. As this is in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, we say that that spirit of truth is Muhammad, and he has guided mankind into all truth. Means every problem affecting mankind, Muhammad has delivered the answers. Problem of race, he gives the answer. Problem of alcoholism, he gives the answer. Gambling, he gives the answer. Fortune telling, he gives the answer. Surplus women, he gives the answer. Divorce, he gives the answer. So every problem with which mankind is confronted today, we said you'll find that they find fulfillment in the teachings of Muhammad as prophesied by Jesus Christ. So, but Christian then, because they stick behind, 2,000 years, at least 600 years before Islam. They stick by that, so the problems are there. Divorce is there. You see? Though Jesus said no divorce, you have divorced by the millions. He turned water into wine, and since then, as I said, our country, 2,000 million last year, they spent on alcohol. Had it been, if you had been listening to his, his injunction, look for this person, he said, the spirit of truth, he will guide you. And if you look for him, and if we start reasoning, and we find that Muhammad is such a person, he will glorify me, he will testify of me, he will bear witness of me. The only one who did all these things is Muhammad. Read the Quran, he tells you his birth. We Muslims, we have no hesitation in confirming that he was born miraculously. What meanings you give to it, we're going to have discussion, differences, points of very great differences. Right. But we said, look, the fundamental that he was born miraculously, instead of insinuating, we could have done. If Muhammad didn't tell us this, you could have said, man, the way jokingly I remarked about your sister coming along, telling about a dream, in which now she is now carrying a babe. Would you believe her? In the absence of your father for a long time, your mother says now she's carrying a baby, she had a dream of your father. Would you believe her? No. So in other words, how would we believe this Jewess 2,000 years ago that she heard voices and she carried a child? On the testimony of Muhammad, 1,000 million Muslims, they agree on the point that he was born miraculously, that he was the Messiah, that he gave life to the dead by God's permission, he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. So in other words, he, it makes us respectful towards this mighty messenger of God. Muhammad testified and he glorified Jesus to his true position. I think it's very interesting that you have identified the spirit of truth as the prophet Muhammad. Is that right? Correct. Now, uh, in Christian revelation, the spirit of truth is God the Holy Spirit, and he will lead us into all truth. And that's where we differ most emphatically, again, because your spirit of truth is the prophet Muhammad, and we believe him to be a false prophet, and our spirit of truth is none other than God the Holy Spirit of truth, to whom Jesus bore witness. And the distinction between the prophet Muhammad and his prohibitions, and the spirit of truth, which is the spirit of God, is the distinction between prohibition on the one hand and self-control on the other. And that is why the Christian virtue is not so much uh, uh, submitting to legalistic prohibitions, but walking in the spirit of self-control. And that's a very important distinction. Mr. You say it is very nice and easy to make flowery statements about the spirit that is working within you and voluntary control. But we see it doesn't happen in humanity. In South Africa, there are 200,000 white alcoholics, whites. 
Among the coloreds, which are Christians, you see the Malay is a Muslim colored, an identity he carries. The colored is a Christian colored, five times the amount of alcoholics as any other race in the country. Of the Indians and the Africans, we have no statistics. Right. Now, had it been that if you had stood by the legalistic, as you say, prohibition, as Jesus Christ spoke in so many things, legalistically he spoke about divorce, legalistically he spoke about adultery, had he the opportunity and if the disciples had the capacity to receive the message, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now, means you haven't got the capacity. For that reason I am leaving to somebody else. And if that Holy Spirit mm. is that Holy Ghost, in 2000 years, I have been asked in 2000 years, this Holy Ghost has not given you a single new thing. Jesus said, I have yet many, many in English means more than one. All, all truth means more than one. I am asking, all churches and denominations have been asking, posing this question too. Perhaps you as a born again Christian, you might be able to supply the answer. No doubt about it. Right. Akbar, he said, we can well, let me uh, just finish, just finish, finish well. this. In 2000 years, I'm asking this Holy Spirit to any church, give me one new truth, only one, that Jesus Christ was not able to give in so many different words. One new. I'm asking. I haven't received it yet. The simple word of that is that the Holy Spirit came after Jesus had ascended and revealed to the disciples the whole truth of the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, kingly reign and return of Jesus, but only the Holy Spirit can reveal that to a darkened heart. Irene, have you a comment? Please, yes. Yes, please. Um, I would like to say that there's a, a, a difference between just the world in general and one who is walking in the laws and statutes of God as brought about by Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. I am a living example and I'm not the only one as you might well have heard today, there are millions around the world of born-again believers who have a real relationship with the Messiah Jesus Christ in his salvation capacity. He says in his word that he shall write his laws upon our hearts and the Holy Spirit shall lead us and guide us into all truth. So in my life in particular, I have had a drastic change brought about from my relationship with Jesus Christ. Before I had that re living relationship, I was just such a one as those in the world that were drinking, smoking, and doing whatever I saw fit in my own sight. But when I came into the living reality of the Lord Jesus Christ as given to us in John chapter 3, that no man shall enter the kingdom of God lest he be born again by the Spirit of God. When that took place in my life, living reality, you said you haven't seen anyone that th these things have happened to. This happened in my life, where his laws were instantly imparted into my life by his Spirit. Alcoholism fell away, smoking fell away, lies, cheating, deceit, all those things fell away. And I became a living example of the power of the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. Madam, I didn't say that I didn't come across a single Christian who would be, you know, a good example of what a good Muslim or a good Christian would be. But this born-again cultism that you're talking about, you see, when you look at in the world today, you're talking about millions. America claims, according to Billy Graham in his book, How to Be Reborn, see there are 70 million born-again Christians in America. 70 million, that's about one third. Yet in that nation, in June, 300,000 sodomites, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage, led by 50 lesbians and motorcycles. In this country, which claims to be a Christian country, at Buffalo, only yesterday, was it a few weeks ago, in Buffalo outside Port Elizabeth. These Christian women, absolutely naked, with bare breasts. Not Christian. They this is where we differentiate. It was, it was organized by a Christian society, that Buffalo rally. So cool. Christians they call themselves. And they had this woman having intercourse with black men in public. This was videotaped, which you can't buy today because mm. it's censored. So I said, look, a system that can save half a dozen here and there, or 70 million as they claim in America, 
It's a good system that if you can save you a few, but a system which stops you from being a drunkard. You see, each and every born again that I meet, he is telling me, he's confessing that he was a drunkard, he was an adulterer, he used to speak Dacha, and on and on. Not one of them said, look, this system saved me. As a Muslim, I can say, and millions of Muslims can say, that look, we don't touch alcohol because my system prohibits it. I haven't touched it, I don't know what it tastes like, and I'm not likely to touch it because my system says no. The biggest society of teetotalers in the world are the Muslims. Simply because, straightforward, directly, we were told, don't touch alcohol, we don't touch it. Don't gamble, we don't gamble. Don't dance, we don't dance. You see, so in other words, a system that can stop you from falling into the mire is a better system than a system that extricates you, salvages you, which you are salvaged, I say congratulations to you. You are also salvaged. As you say, you are born again. I say congratulations to you. Praise the Lord. Right? But I said the system that stops you from falling into that mire is a better system than the one that allows you to go in. Mr. Didant, at this point, if you uh, want to speak with that tone, I actually know a lot of Muslims. I've been to Israel and I know a lot who partake of alcohol. So the basis that you're speaking on... <laughs> You know, it doesn't really make sense because we are claiming something which you yourself are claiming. You're claiming it from the legalistic point of view that you are told not to do. We're claiming it from the spiritual point of view that God gives us the ability not to do. So, and we have also differentiated, which you've avoided now, in the fact that there are differences in Christianity, the same as there are differences, you would say, in Islam, those that are totally devoted and those who are not. In Christianity, there's only one that is called a Christian by Almighty God. And that one is the one who has become born again by the Spirit of the living God, through the blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed on the cross for him to save him from those sins. All else that you might, might look at, speaking about buffalo rallies and the rest of them, those are what I have come out of. Those are the people that Jesus Christ came to save. He said, I have not come to save those that are well, but those that need a physician. Those are the ones that he wants to save. Irene, can I stop you at that point, please? Unfortunately, right. time is drawing to a close. I'd like to thank all of you very much for speaking today. Uh, Akhidida, um, Jonathan Leach, uh, Irene Malin, thank you very much indeed. Before we close totally, can I just ask that each of you give us one minute, and I ask, please, only one minute in summary of today's talk. Irene, can I ask you to talk first, please? Well, I would say that um, apart from all the differences that be, uh, whether it be differences of translation or whether it be differences of this, that, and the other, there is a thread that works its way through the entire Christian field, and that is the thread of the blood of Jesus Christ, which has been shed for us, and which is there for the whosoever will. Thank you, Irene. Jonathan? I want to close with a verse, and I'm going to finish in 60 seconds. You wanted a verse from Jesus. He said to them, Then how does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put thine enemies beneath thy feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on ask him another question. And Ahmed, when you understand the answer to that question, you too will know that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. And I'm not saved by a system, I'm saved by a person, and he is Jesus, the Son of God. Thank you, Jonathan. You see, uh, Jonathan, you read scripture which needs discussion. You speak about Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. And God Almighty has made him to sit there for 2,000 years. What is he doing? He is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Can you imagine the scene? For 2,000 years, this poor man is sitting there waiting for his enemies to be made a footstool for him. And who are his enemies? The Jews. They are sitting there, you know, in, in the Middle East. They still deny Jesus Christ. In the whole world, they deny Jesus. And yet, poor Jesus, for 2,000 years, he has not reached that yet. Let me quote and end with the scripture, the words of Jesus himself. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed 
the righteousness, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm, now, well we said. Muslims, we stand by that. That you, the Christians, his followers, you must be better than the Jew, otherwise there's no heaven for you. This shortcut of blood is a something that is pagan in its origin. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Well, as uh, an absolute novice in religion, I make no attempt to summarize the discussion today myself. I leave that to you, the viewer. Thank you.